picky eater is someone who takes an eating habit to the extreme. 22-year-old Josh has an obsession with pizza. Pizza for breakfast, pizza for lunch, pizza for dinner. God, I love the pizza. And it's taking a serious toll on his health. Josh's uncle David is desperate for someone to help. If it's left unchecked, he is going to kill himself. Can specialists Mike Dow and JJ Virgin break this dangerous addiction? This is how much pizza you eat in a year. Damn. In order to save his stomach. This is poisonous to your body. And his life. This is incredibly dangerous to your health. If we do not help him, Josh could die. My name is David, and Josh, my nephew, is a freaky eater. 22-year-old Josh eats pizza three meals a day. Some good stuff. A total of 1,800 pounds every single year, 80 times more than the average person. Josh's pizza consumption is to excess. It's gotten to the point where it's a compulsion. I crave pizza every time I want a meal. Right now, I want pizza. I don't know what made me want it. I just want it. He'll eat it hot. Cold, one day old, frozen, microwaved. Josh's only nutrition comes from the 2,000 cups of white flour, 250 cups of tomato sauce, and 230 pounds of cheese that he eats every year. God, I love the pizza. Josh's diet concerns me, scares me really, because I feel like if it's left unchecked, that he is going to kill himself. When Josh was a child, he ate a variety of foods. Joshua was not a picky eater when he was younger. The picky eating didn't start until he actually had money to buy his own food. Starting in third grade, Josh was able to buy his own lunches, and that's when pizza became a problem. On Fridays, if you waited till the second bell, after the lunch lady had extras, um, she'd give you an extra big slice of pizza. Soon, Josh was eating pizza whenever he could get his hands on it, and gradually, other foods disappeared from his diet. The last time I could remember eating a vegetable was probably fifth grade, when my mom forced me to eat some, and I, and I ate some just to disguise the other hand, grabbing it in the napkin to throw it away. Despite his terrible diet, Josh pushed himself as an athlete, and he excelled in high school volleyball. Joshua the athlete was actually quite quite good. During high school, he was MVP, and he helped to coach the teams. And then when he started playing beach volleyball, we saw a lot of a great future for him. It was very exciting to watch him play, because he was good at it. Um, and you could just tell he enjoyed it. He beamed. He smiled. Volleyball was the most important thing to me. But then three years ago, when Josh was 19, he suddenly became ill. I was at volleyball practice and I was just running and then all of a sudden I just had this <coughs> urge to just vomit. <coughs> and then it started happening day after day after day after day. And then after a month, it started happening when I was waking up and it's been going on for two and a half years. When I wake up in the morning, I have about 10 to 30 minutes of hell. I'll have a massive headache, my heart will be palpitating. I have about 10 to 30 minutes to throw up. It's like mentally just agonizing, you know, every morning waking up like that. Josh was passed from doctor to doctor over the course of three years. After countless tests and scans, not one could diagnose him. The most they could do was prescribe migraine medication. I've actually sat down and told the doctors how much pizza you actually eat every day, every week. I told him I ate a lot of pizza, but I remember that exactly. Before Josh got sick, he was a young man with a plan. You know, he was in school, he was playing volleyball regularly, and all of his dreams of being a pro volleyball player, of finishing school, just absolutely evaporated. I lost volleyball, I lost so many friends, I lost working out, I lost going to the beach. So there's a deep, a deep hole. Forced to quit the sport that had come to define him, by the age of 20, Josh had lost everything. His athletic dreams, his friends, and his self-esteem. Come on, eat it, it's good. You can have it, I don't want it. It has vegetables and stuff in there. Eventually, he left school and moved in with his grandmother. He 
is not eating any vegetables or any fruit. One of these days I'm gonna give up on you. As he descended deeper and deeper into depression, Josh ate more and more pizza, his one comfort. He currently eats over 469 pizzas each year, 320 slices every single month. I definitely forget about my problems when I'm eating pizza. For that moment, I'm not thinking about volleyball. So whatever's going on after I eat that pizza, I like that feeling. So how much of this pizza do you think you're gonna be able to eat? I'll probably eat my half. I think for Josh, the amount of pizza that he eats is at the very least, if it does not cause his illness, it aggravates it. I could answer 100% to my heart of hearts that I do not believe my diet has anything to do with the way that I feel physically. There's way more foods that are way more unhealthy than pizza. Josh's life is spiraling out of control, and he needs help before it's too late. With Josh's health declining by the day, his uncle has finally convinced him to meet with freaky eater specialist, Dr. Mike Dow, and nutritionist, JJ Virgin. Over the next two days, they'll attempt to help him break his addiction and get his life back on track. My uncle's always told me he's concerned with the way I eat. To have him have some other people join in now makes me really realize how concerned he is. Hi. Hi, I'm JJ. I'm a certified nutrition specialist. I've been teaching people how to get healthy for the past 25 years, and I've literally worked with thousands of people from all walks of life. Josh, Dr. Mike Dow. I'm a licensed psychotherapist with specializations in eating disorders and addictive behaviors. We've heard from your uncle that there's some really serious health stuff going on. So he brought us in to right. basically change your life. <sighs> JJ and I are absolutely the people that are going to get through to Josh. He's already been to doctors. What he needs are people that are going to get to the heart of the matter, how his psychology, how his nutrition, all of these things are impacting the way he feels, the way he eats. It sounds like there's a lot of people in your family who are very worried about you. Are you worried about you? <sighs> yeah. And are you ready to do something about it? I think I'm at a, at a point now where I'm willing to try anything to, to improve my life. Good so luck. I'm kind of apprehensive if they're trying to make a link between my illness and the way I eat. I'm not sure that's connected, but I am definitely willing to hear what they had to say. Coming up, will a dose of shock therapy convince Josh to change? So Josh, this is how much pizza you eat in a year. Damn. Josh refuses to believe that his all-pizza diet is responsible for the mysterious illness that has destroyed his life. I lost volleyball, I lost so many friends. There's a deep hole. Freaky Eater specialists Dr. Mike Dow and JJ Virgin are hoping that some shock therapy will open Josh's eyes to the effect of his disastrous diet. So Josh, this is how much pizza you eat in a year. Wow. 469 boxes. You look shocked. Yeah. In this box, white flour, sugary sauce, cheese, salt, the amount you are getting in a year, 230 pounds of cheese that's loaded with saturated fat. Damn. Nearly 2,000 cups of white flour. That's fast track to diabetes and heart disease right there. I'm beyond myself. Shock therapy is really realizing the amount of detrimental stuff you are putting in your body. Seeing it, presenting it, helps the patient to say, wow, this is what I'm doing to myself. We've got one more thing we need to show you. This here represents the fat in those 469 pieces. This is 80 pounds of the baddest fat of all trans fat, saturated fat, consuming this amount of this type of fat is gonna give you heart disease or cancer or diabetes. It's just a matter, Josh, of which one's gonna get you first. It looked like vomit. It really hit me that like what I was putting into my body could possibly be like what I was throwing up. I want you to actually feel what it is like to choose to put this in your body. And we are going to ask you to pour all of this fat into that vat. So just pour it in there? Yep.
If that tin is your body and your veins, what does that mean? Probably a heart attack. Yeah. Oh my God, I could have had a heart attack. What I want to ask you to do is to pick up that silver vat of fat, and I want you to hold it for as long as you can. How does that feel? It's heavy. Heavy? When it's ready to go, I just want you to drop it. <sighs> oh. It definitely felt good to throw the fat and be able to do it and get it away from me as far as possible. Now, there's one more thing. We've arranged to get some blood tests done because we really need to see what kind of damage you've caused with your 469 pizzas a year. So we're going to go out and get those now. All right, it's good okay. to work. Before the lab results come back, Dr. Dow wants to get to the root of Josh's addiction to pizza by bringing him to the place that triggered his downward spiral. It's been a while since you picked up one of these. Huh? Yeah. Tell me about how you got into volleyball. My mom actually forced me, forced me to play. She said that we all had to be two sport athletes in high school. Did you want to play volleyball? Once I started playing and I saw that I had promise, I, I realized that maybe this is a, a way that I could kind of show them that I could accomplish something, be good at something. If you were talking to your mom at that time, what was it that you needed from her that you didn't get? The approval in my eyes. I don't, I don't think I was still on the track to be getting that approval. You needed their approval? Yeah. In assessing Josh's self-worth, he didn't have very many things that made him feel good enough about himself like he did when he was an athlete. When he stopped getting that, he turned to cheese pizza. So he used this object, this food, to get things that he was not getting in his life. When you started playing volleyball, this was actually something that made you feel really good about yourself. Yeah. And then tell me about pizza coming in. Once I lost volleyball, that's when I started to realize uh. I didn't have control over anything anymore. So there were some things going on in your life that you were not in control of. I think it all just kind of started once the sickness happened. Yeah. Once I wasn't able to play volleyball anymore, it all kind of just crumbled away. Yeah. And, and then I was just desperately grasping for something. And you didn't have anything else, so you gravitated towards pizza. So everything in the way you felt, the way you thought was, I can't control that, but I can control this. Yeah. We have to figure out what are the things in your life that you can start to feel good about. Uh-huh. Not until today did I ever start to really make the connection between what I was eating and why I was eating it. Before, it was nothing more than I'm hungry and I feel like eating pizza. Now I'm starting to think maybe it's more. Ready to take the next step? Yeah. Coming up, will the lab tests finally reveal the truth behind Josh's illness? Wow. Josh has been grappling with a mysterious illness for the past three years. I'll have a massive headache. My heart will be palpitating. And then I have about 10 to 30 minutes to throw up. Determined to find the answer behind his illness, JJ arranged for Josh to have specialized testing to look for a link between his physical condition and his diet. I just got the blood test back from the lab, and the news is not good. You've had food allergy testing, right? Mm -hmm. So there's food allergies, and that's like when you eat a peanut and your, you know, your throat closes up. Mm -hmm. And then there's another type of response. It's an immune response called a delayed food sensitivity. Mm -hmm. This is very different. This happens because you eat the same food over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, your body can actually start to become sensitive to it and starts to have a toxic response to it. But worse than that, your body actually craves it. Mm -hmm. So you eat it and the, the reaction to it's delayed. You might eat it and eight hours later you start to feel worse. So you don't directly tie it to the food but your body starts to create an immune response that makes you crave the very food that's hurting you. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, hearing that, what do you think you probably are reacting to? The pizza, the, or the cheese or something that's in there. Bingo. What? See these greater than 2,000? Mm -hmm. That's a huge response. See how you're written severe? Wow. The dairy, that's toxic for you. Right. Right? Yeah. It's just exactly like poison. This is poisonous to your body. The type of lab tests that we're looking at now are very different. They aren't done traditionally by doctors, and so they've been missed. 
I'm overwhelmed with emotion right now. I don't even, I don't even know what to think. I would have bet any amount of money that the, my diet had nothing to do with my sickness. And now I know my diet was my sickness and it changes everything. Wow. It took three years and now it's just finally, we have, we have an answer. All of it's fixed with food. It hands me hard. I gotta do what I gotta do, you know. Josh now faces the daunting task of removing pizza from his diet completely. But JJ and Dr. Dow have a plan to keep him on track. So what I did was put together a menu to make this, again, simple for you, yeah. OK? And so I laid out some breakfasts for you. There are going to be things that you've been eating already, uh -huh. OK, with a healthy twist. I've created a menu plan for Josh that's going to be a bit of a challenge. What I tried to do was take things that he was already eating or already familiar with and then put a challenge in there, like vegetables. Well, you have homework for me. That is creating quality time so that you can get your needs met in your relationships that are important to you. Josh's homework is a combination of the nutritional plan put together by JJ, and he's going to be improving his life by spending time with his family, improving his relationships. Are these homework assignments something that you are clear about? I'm, they're very clear, I'm gonna do them. Okay. Going cold turkey is hard because dairy is in every single food Josh loves but also when he stops eating it, his body is going to scream. He's gonna crave it so much. Coming up, Josh tries to adapt to a pizza-free diet, mm. but will the temptation prove too much? <laughs> you could tell that he wanted to take a bite. That hurts. Dr. Dow and JJ have given Josh the tools to conquer his addiction. But now the true test is managing it on his own. The first couple days that Josh makes this change are going to be brutal. But within a week, he's going to feel like a new man. That fatigue, the headaches, they'll be gone. It's Josh's first full day without pizza in three years. And as JJ predicted, his body is suffering the effects of withdrawal. It's all tough right now. You know, no dairy whatsoever, no sugar. I do not feel physically strong. I'm always hungry. The following day, Josh takes Dr. Dow's advice and spends some time with his siblings for emotional support. Brother. What's up? Brought you some food. But each meal without pizza is a struggle. Right now, every time I have a meal, my body's wishing I had cheese on it. I just miss the taste of pizza, really. I think I've been eating it tastes that good. Emotionally, it's draining thinking about every meal and what I used to be able to eat and what I can eat now, and having to try to eat all these vegetables, it's really frustrating. I'm really agitated. Mm. Eating vegetables every day sucks. It's Josh's third day without pizza, and physically, he's feeling much better, but he also finds himself surrounded by temptations. You know, I went down the aisle where I usually get pizza, and it was just like, everything looked so appealing. I took extreme self-control on the third day. So three days, I think, is pushing it. Finally on day five, JJ and Dr. Dow feel Josh is ready for his toughest challenge yet, an Italian dinner without pizza. Josh has made major changes in his diet, and this is no easy task. What may be even more difficult for Josh is resisting temptation in real life situations. What Josh doesn't know is that his entire family is waiting to join him. How you doing? Hello, How you doing? I was very surprised to see my whole family sitting there. I was kind of nervous. Looking at that menu, I realized I'd never looked at a menu before. I can't be ignorant. You know, I might need to eat some things I'm not going to enjoy just to reap the benefits. I'm Maria. I'm taking your order tonight. Well, we looked at that menu, and I thought there's nothing on here that he's eaten in the last 10 years. What is he going to pick? I guess I'm going to be getting the shrimp and clams the Teresa. Wow. <laughs> clams. Love it. Amazing. I never thought I'd see the day where we'd go out to dinner and Josh would order anything other than pizza. I was shocked. <laughs> Can I get the classic margarita pizza? Oh. <laughs> 
I was actually very glad that Josh's brother ordered the pizza because those real life behavioral triggers, when somebody's gonna have the pizza, that's what Josh needs to experience. And I could smell the pizza, I could smell the bread, I could smell the cheese. It was tough. Very good. What do you think? Good. Very good. Good, right? Yes. I can't bring myself to believe that this is actually it. As every day that goes by and he feels better, my confidence grows. Josh, here. Here, here we are. Thank you. Graduating to good health. I don't think words can express, you know, how grateful I am. With just a few small changes to his diet, Josh has gone from someone with nothing to live for no school, no career, and no future to someone who has hope and a clear path to getting his life back. I'm feeling less nauseous. I feel like I'm thinking more clearly. I feel like I stared death in the face and I made a choice and now I'm starting over and I have the potential to be bigger, better, and stronger than I was before. I can't believe that, you know, through all of this, pizza was my enemy. A freaky eater is someone who takes an eating habit to the extreme. 20-year-old Amy has a hardcore addiction to cola. I drink more cola than everybody I know. Downing 30 colas a day. That's over 10,000 cans every year. Me and cola are best friends. Her family believes it's destroying her health. After her surgery, the first thing she wanted was cola. But she laughs off everyone's concerns. It goes one year, not the other. With just one week of intense therapy. You are on a very scary path. Oh my God. Can specialists Dr. Mike Dow and JJ Virgin break down Amy's defenses? I don't need therapy. Before her life goes down the drain. That's not gonna make anything better. Well then do it for me. <laughs> My sister Amy is a freaky eater. 20-year-old Amy is addicted to cola. Amy drinks a soda all the time, out of control. She drinks, on average, 30 cans of cola all day, every single day. More than 1,000 gallons each year. I drink more cola than everybody I know. It only took me two days to fill this up. The most I had probably in a day is 50 cans. I'm always drinking cola. I need them everywhere I go. From her cola alone, Amy drinks more than 4,000 calories. That's two and a half pounds of sugar every single day. Me and cola are best friends. Whenever I have cola by my side, I feel safe. Amy's family immigrated to the United States from Russia when Amy was just five years old. Her very first meal in America was a fast food lunch with a cola. Amy started to drink soda and she loved it. Indulged by her parents, Amy began drinking cola with every single meal. My parents always allowed me to have soda. I got everybody wrapped around my finger. As she got older, her tolerance for the sugar and caffeine gradually increased and Amy's consumption rose to a staggering average of 30 cans each day. She drinks a case of cola a day with no problem. Now 20, Amy lives at home with her parents, but doesn't eat anything like the rest of her family. My mom cooks some pretty healthy food, but Amy, she doesn't have none of that. This is so delicious. This is too. Instead, Amy has her own version of a well-balanced meal. Chips, cookies, little sweets. I like to dunk these in my soda. That tastes so good. Amy's eating habits are really disgusting. I don't know what else to say about that. Ironically, Amy works as a surgical technician, but her extreme sugar and caffeine consumption has her feeling almost as bad as her patients. 
I do get tired a lot. I don't have that much energy, but at the same time, soda is what gets me through the day. Recently, Amy had a serious health scare when she discovered a lump in her chest, which her doctor suggested might be due to excess caffeine. She told me, I think that you drink too much caffeine and that is why you have the tumor. Although Amy had surgery to remove the benign tumor, her doctor suggested she cut back on the cola. She was throwing up. They were pumping her with like all kinds of stuff. And I was crazy. I'm like, wow, all this for what, cola? However, that hasn't stopped Amy from drinking massive quantities on a daily basis. I was scared, you know, I don't want to be in the surgery room ever again, but I don't want to stop. If Amy does not stop drinking cola, she'll probably end up getting diabetes. You know, it's not good for you. It was the one year, not the other. We're not getting through to her. She's not listening to us. It's breaking my heart. I don't want Amy to die. Desperate for help, Amy's family has called in the help of freaky eater specialists, Dr. Mike Dow and JJ Virgin. They hope that a week of nutritional and psychological therapy will convince Amy to change. Hi there. My name is Dr. Mike Dow. I'm a psychotherapist, and I specialize in addictive behaviors and eating disorders. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having us. Come on, please. My name is JJ Virgin. I'm a board-certified nutrition specialist. While Amy is at work, Dr. Dow and JJ take the opportunity to find out more about her addiction. So tell us a little bit about your sister. Uh, she's got a really big problem with uh, cola. She just drinks more and more every day. It seems like getting worse. How does she seem physically drinking all the soda? How's her health? Well, I don't know if you guys know, she already had surgery from her cola intake. Amy's surgery is not necessarily linked to cola consumption, but if she does want to avoid future surgeries and disease, she needs to stop. And that uh, didn't do anything to get no, her to yeah. stop? When she got up from her surgery, she wanted a cola. My mom sneaked it in. Wow. So Amy's mom's been enabling her cola habit. It's going to be a real challenge helping Amy get healthy when her mom is more concerned with keeping her happy. It sounds like an addiction. Mm. Yeah, it is an addiction. When she gets up, if she doesn't have a soda, she's going to be grumpy. She doesn't want to say anything to us or nothing. From an emotional and psychological point of view, I am very concerned for Amy because she's been engaging in this behavior for 15 years. It is going to be difficult for her to stop. We've got a good mm. start. So we'll take it from here. Oh, thank, thank you. Now that we've got the inside scoop from Amy's mother and brother, it's time to confront Amy. Coming up, will another health scare convince Amy to change? You are on a very scary path. Oh my god. 20-year-old Amy is addicted to cola, consuming nearly 30 cans every single day. At her family's urging, Amy has begrudgingly agreed to meet with Freaky Eater specialists to discuss her problem. Hello. Hi. How are you, Amy? Good. I'm JJ Virgin. Nice to meet you. I am going to be your nutrition expert. It's good to meet you. Me too. And I'm Dr. Mike Dow. I'm an eating disorder expert and psychotherapist. OK. Your mom and your brother, they're a little worried about your cola consumption. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I understand my mom is scared for me, but it is what it is, and hopefully she doesn't have to be scared anymore. Are you concerned about your health? I am. Mm -hmm. I think Amy is somewhat open to change. I hope that the things that JJ and I are going to do with her increase that motivation. Amy claims that she wants to be healthy, but Dr. Dow and JJ believe that shock therapy is the only way for her to understand the seriousness of her addiction. Wow. This is the amount of cola you drink in one month. That's, those are a lot of boxes. 37 cases. The average person drinks one case. Uh -huh. In a cola, it starts with tap water. Then they add sugar, phosphoric acid to make it bubbly, and caffeine. <laughs> I ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> it looks like she doesn't really care. I get the sense that really the stakes may not be high enough for Amy. We have some more to show you. Wow, OK. <laughs> Dr. Dow and JJ show me a pyramid of soda. Uh, I know that's a lot, but it just doesn't yeah, affect me. 
Wow. 950 pounds of sugar is what you get in your cola each year. Wow. <laughs> when Amy's scared, when Amy's shocked, Amy laughs to defuse the situation. So every bag represents how much sugar you are putting into your body in a 10-day period, 25 pounds. It was just a big stack of sugar to me, to tell you the truth. I know that that's how much I intake, but it just doesn't get to me. This will inevitably lead to diabetes. <laughs> that's crazy. I expected Amy, when she looked at this gigantic wall of cola and stack of sugar, to be ashamed, remorseful, guilty, but she's not. We've got a lot of work to do. If a freaky eater is open to change, a week of intensive therapy can get them well on the road to recovery. But as Amy is still in denial, JJ wants her to have some blood drawn to see if the findings will be enough to convince her. I'm done. Okay. The next morning, JJ brings Amy to a local juice bar to share the results of her blood test and hopefully start her on the path to healthier eating. I have to warn you that the results are not good, okay? All right? And if you take this to heart and you do something about it, you can turn things around. But if you don't, you are on a very scary path. Okay, you know that one of the big risks of sugar is what? Diabetes. Okay, yeah. what we see right here is you're already a pre-diabetic. Oh my God. The average person gets diabetes at 35, so you might not have that much time. Pre-diabetic means that you're already showing those changes that are taking you down the path towards diabetes. Your blood sugar is running higher than normal and your insulin is high as well. When you have high insulin, it puts you at a higher risk for cancers, breast cancer, cysts. Doesn't look good to me. <laughs> no, it's really scary. Your body's trying to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. Will you listen to this? Yes, absolutely. Diabetes scares me. That's like a life and death. As JJ hoped, Amy has agreed to try to change, and they are in a perfect place to start. JJ's plan is to replace Amy's junk food diet with more wholesome alternatives, starting with breakfast. Every day, you're going to start the day with a shake. The smoothie is an easy way to get breakfast in and get a lot of nutrition in to boot. Ready to try your new breakfast? Yes. <laughs> That is not so good. <laughs> I think Amy thought all she had to do was give it a little taste, but I was determined that she really give it a chance. Give it another try. Okay. I didn't like the smoothie. It didn't taste good. It was too thick. Everything about it, I didn't like. Play around. Find a way to make it the way you like it. Now that Amy will be getting at least some nutrition, JJ wants to tackle the colas. I can't take Amy off cola cold turkey. She'd crash and burn. It can cause a whole host of reactions, including headaches, fatigue, irritability. And I want to make sure that I'm setting her up for success. So here's how we're going to do it. The first day, we're going to go to 16. We're gonna go from 16 down to 12 the next day. We're gonna go from 12 to 10, 10 to eight, eight to six, six to four, four to two. Day by day, does that sound like something you can do? It'll be hard, but I will do it. I feel like I finally got through to Amy. She realized she can't keep doing what she's doing. She's not getting away with it. Let's get started. Okay. Coming up, can Amy face up to her addiction? You are setting yourself up for failure. So Amy's staggering consumption of cola has her showing signs of diabetes at only 20 years old. Amy has finally agreed to cut down. But in order to do that, she'll need the support of her entire family. 
Instead of the family enabling Amy's addiction, I want the family to help her beat this. Natasha, you smuggled in a soda when Amy was waking up from surgery. Yeah, I did. You buying her a substance that for her is something she is trying to give up is in some way enabling and helping her to continue this pattern. I need a commitment okay. from this family from now on that there will be no buying soda by anybody in this family except for Amy. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> cool. Since you are now willing to do whatever it takes, I would like all of the soda in this whole house to be placed on this counter right now. Are we ready? Can you guys help me with this? Yeah. All the colas out here on this island. Ah, the secret stash. Wow. A lot of cola, Amy. Amy's plan calls for her to gradually taper off cola day by day. And to make sure she sticks to that, Dr. Dow wants to remove all excess colas from the house. I'm gonna now ask you and your family to open and pour out the rest of those cans. Oh no, yes. Why? It's a waste of, you know, I'm gonna eventually have to go out and buy it. Exactly. Part of treating addictive behaviors is making it more difficult for you to get the substance that you are addicted to. And if you are allowing this to be in your house, you are setting yourself up for failure. So, Natasha, could I ask you and the family to pour out these into the kitchen sink, please? Since we are now enlisting no your help okay. in helping Amy. You want me to do the first one? Yeah. OK, oh, yeah. come on. I'll do it. OK. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do anything you want to. You don't do it. <laughs> Amy was angry and she was resistant. All of that tells me how severe the addiction to cola really is. I would like to ask you to pour one cola into the sink. One. No, At least one. It, no. I wanted Amy to be the one pouring out some of the cola. It is a symbolic sort of ritual that says, I'm committing to this. That won't mean anything. <laughs> That's just going to well, mean that. If it doesn't mean anything, then, then do it. Yeah. I thought she really was going to try to change, but she seems like she's reluctant still. Wasn't too happy about that at all. That's not going to make anything better, me spilling a soda. Then do it for me. I did not see a point of spilling out the soda. I was just irritated. <coughs> I have this one. I could spill this okay, one. OK, spill that one out for me. OK. The whole therapy sessions by Dr. Dow are not working out. Okay. I do not need therapy. Regardless, if Amy wants to succeed, she needs to stick to JJ's plan. Instead of drinking her usual average of 30 colas a day, she must now make 58 cans last the entire week. Are you being accountable to not only yourself, to your family and to me, that you are agreeing that this, the next seven days, is your cola? You're just going to drink this the whole week? Yes. This amount? Yes. What I want from you is a commitment. Right. I am committed, yes. Amy has a lot to do over the course of the next week. She hasn't had that aha moment yet, but she has had moments of realization where she is maybe starting to say, I need to make changes in my life. Coming up, will Amy keep her word? Are you gonna cut down? Deep down inside, I don't want to stop. I don't know what to do. JJ and Dr. Dow have given Amy a seven day plan to help her kick her cola addiction. This. The next seven days is your cola. Now, it is up to her to make the allotted 58 cans last the week. It's Amy's first day on the new plan. And as JJ outlined, she's supposed to cut down from her average of 30 cans a day to just 16. My plan is to cut down as much as I can. By the end of day one, Amy has managed to cut down a little. I drink 24 cans of soda which is an improvement. But she is still far from hitting the daily target JJ had set for her, which was 16 colas. It's day two, and Amy's assignment is to reduce down to 12 colas. To help her start the day right, Amy's mom offers a smoothie for breakfast. I gonna make it for you. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, why it's tomorrow morning? Why? Why tomorrow morning? But why not today? 
I don't know what to do. By the middle of day two, Amy has already failed to keep her daily goal of 12 colas. Instead, she has 24. Maybe tomorrow I'll start my progress. Or maybe not. <laughs> or maybe not. By day three, Amy only has 10 colas left from the 58 she was allotted for the week. Almost out of a soda. And she heads to the market to restock. There's my friend. It's my best friend. On top of the shopping list. And that's it. I'm done. Over the next three days, Amy continues to spiral out of control. Amy does not seem like she wants to listen. She's not stopping. While she was given 58 colas for the week, she's had over 160. There hasn't been no progress at all. And am I disappointed in myself? No, not at all. With Amy's health on the line, Dr. Dow and JJ return on the seventh day to confront her about her relapse and see if they can get her back on track. It doesn't sound like Amy's changed at all. If we can't get through to Amy today, there's really no hope. When did it fall apart? Um, I, I didn't cut down. This, this is too short for me just to quit out of nowhere. You How know? much time do you need? Uh, I don't know. Amy, are you an addict? I'm not an addict, no. Are you? I'm just a, a soda lover. <laughs> Amy is using denial to prevent herself from coming to terms with the fact that this behavior could kill her. I enjoy soda, so that's... It's a little more than enjoying. Enjoying a soda is having, having a soda a day. Being hooked is when you have to have it every hour, hour in, hour out, despite making a commitment and looking me dead in the eye and saying you were going to taper yeah. down. Amy, are you going to try to cut down? I'm concerned, but what I heard from inside, she seemed like she still wants to change, but I just don't know when she'll accomplish that. Amy has used every excuse in the book. That's not going to make anything better. This comes back to the fact that Amy is an addict. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow night, tomorrow morning. Until a freaky eater comes to terms with their addiction and admits they have a problem, no amount of therapy can be successful. I wish she'd engaged this past week so we could have been there and really held her hand. She's got the tools now, but she's going to need to do it on her own. It's just a habit that I can't stop. And deep down inside, I don't want to stop. A freaky eater is someone who takes an eating habit to the extreme. Christine is addicted to sugar. Sugar is the love of my life. Candy bars, jelly beans, cakes. She can't go a single hour without a sugar fix. My cupboard cannot be empty. Her son Kevin is sick with worry. If things don't change, I can see getting a phone call in the middle of the night from a hospital in California. With one week of intense therapy, can experts Mike Dow and JJ Virgin help Christine to let go of the past? That addiction is not just affecting you. You can't just take it away. You can't. Before it destroys her future. The stakes are high. We are talking about Christine's health, happiness, and really her life. My mom is addicted to sugar. 47-year-old Christine is completely dependent on sugar. When I'm chewing candy, it, it's comforting to me. Sugar is the love of my life. Christine devours cake for breakfast, bags of candy for lunch, and Sundays for dinner. My mom eats sugar all day, every day. Each day, she consumes over 6,500 calories in nothing but sweets. My mom can't even go one hour without eating sugar. When I wake up in the morning, I have to reach over and grab my black jelly bean. I eat sweet things everywhere. I eat first thing in the morning. I eat it while I'm driving. Five bags of jelly beans. She has the mentality of a five-year-old when she goes grocery shopping. It's just junk food and sugar. 
This is what I'd buy. And this would only last me a week. A week. Christine grew up on a farm in rural Nebraska as one of eight children, but she never enjoyed any of the fresh foods the farm had to offer. I liked the, the candy and the, the ho-hos and the Twinkies. They made me happy. Christine married young at the age of 20, and she and her husband had two children. But five years later, their marriage turned sour. After a bitter divorce, Christine's children went to live with their father. Devastated, Christine turned to sugar for comfort. My mom being separated from us was very hard on her. I was um, the single mom, I guess you could say, and so I had to be the fun mom. So when my kids came, we went for ice cream, we baked cookies, we ate candy. She fed us sugar all the time. You could go to any cupboard, any drawer, and there was candy there waiting for you. But there was never a home-cooked, sit-down meal with my mom. I feel like sugar makes you happy. And uh, so when you're eating sugar constantly, you're happy. And I wanted my kids to think I was happy. Once her children were grown, Christine moved to California to manage a restaurant and start a new life. But her addiction to sugar continued to spiral out of control. I don't know where to turn because it's embarrassing. I don't want to feel like I'm that different from the rest of the world. Afraid of being judged by others, Christine refuses to try new things. Instead, she uses sugar to fill the void. I live near the beach. However, I'm extremely scared of water. I just stand back and I watch other people feeling sorry for myself. With both her children thousands of miles away, Christine has deliberately cut herself off from the rest of the world. My mom is halfway across the country and I'm at Texas. She was very isolated in her life. I feel lonely, but I will never tell that to anybody. If you're alone, You'll never have any frustrations or disappointments in life. I have to put some sugar in me so that I could at least be energized because I just can't let people know <laughs> that I have all this pain. After every sugar spree, Christine suffers from excruciating headaches, and lately, she noticed her moods were becoming erratic. If I go more than an hour without sugar, you do not want to talk to me. I need sugar. Without sugar, oh my gosh. After a recent binge on over 100 pieces of fudge, Christine suffered a debilitating headache that lasted for days. If things don't change, I can see getting a phone call in the middle of the night from a hospital in California saying I need to get on the first flight out. Scared for his mother's life, Kevin has flown to California to get her the help she needs. My name is Dr. Mike Dow. I'm a psychotherapist, and I specialize in addictive behaviors and eating disorders. My name is JJ Virgin, and I'm a board-certified nutrition specialist. Kevin called us today because he is very concerned about his mother's health, and rightly so. Her daily consumption of sugar is staggering. Thank you very much for meeting me here. My mom doesn't know I'm here. She just lives a few blocks down and uh, I want to make sure that she gets some help. Uh, I live in Texas, and uh, she doesn't have anybody else out here, so she's certainly lonely, and, and it is a lot of isolation. The stakes are high. We are talking about Christine's health, happiness, and really her life. All right, well, let's go meet her. I'm nervous. My mom's really stubborn and stuck in her ways, and it's going to be hard for JJ and Dr. Dow to crack that. Coming up. Will Kevin's plea be enough to convince Christine to change? I don't want you to take it away. You can't just take it away. That's you can't. Right. For the past 20 years, Christine has been held hostage by her addiction to sugar. Over the next week, Freaky Eater specialists will attempt to help her break free. Christine has no idea that Kevin, JJ, and I are about to enter in her life and help her to enter treatment. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! <laughs> it's been a while, huh? What are you doing here? Can we come in? Oh yeah, come on in. When I saw Kevin on my doorstep, 
I was shocked to see him, and then seeing people next to him, I thought, well, here he's bringing his friends again. Why the surprise? I just would like to, to talk to you with these guys and, and see if we can't get your health situation taken care of because I've been away from you for so long, and I want to make sure things are good with you and that you're healthy. Thanks. <laughs> I love you. I know you do. I'm JJ Virgin. I'm a nutrition specialist. <laughs> well, that's something I could use. I'm Dr. Mike Dahm, a psychotherapist. My first thought was I was excited, and then it went to embarrassment. How long has this been going on? Probably since I lost my kid. So, like, 20 years. Do you feel powerless over Sugar Christine? I know sugar has controlled me. That's why I don't I don't want you to take it away. You can't just you can't just take it away. You can't. Christine has created this perfect storm of addiction. So not only does she self-medicate feelings of sadness or loneliness, she actually needs sugar to feel normal. We've got some things we need to show you. Okay? Come on. I'm ready. Come with us. With Christine trapped in a downward spiral of addiction, Dr. Dow and JJ want to show her where her current path is headed. The whole point of the shock therapy is for her to make that extreme connection that what she's putting into her mouth is going to put her into the grave. Oh my God. It was a grave made out of sugar. You've got to be kidding. I'm not ready for this. 750 pounds is the amount of sugar that you eat in a year. We have more to show you. I've seen bad eating habits over the years, but I've never seen sugar intake like this. Do I get to take this home? Do you know what that sugar does to you? It increases your risk of every major disease, heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes. Eventually, we're all going to die. I just don't want to know. Christine, you're using a lot of avoidance because you don't really want to come to terms with what this truly means for you and your life. So when the grandchild comes over, what do you feed them? What well, does this what... signify? Is this love? Well, that's what they like. Kids like sugar. Why don't you ask your son what his favorite memory of you and your relationship was? Was it sugar cookies? That's not why I got excited to see you. It was spending time with you that brought me to visit you. Addiction is not just affecting you, it's affecting your son. And we've asked him to write to the Christine that is going down this path. Christine loves her son so much. If she realizes that she is also hurting him, maybe that will be the thing that is going to give her enough strength to do whatever it takes to treat this addiction. Kevin, would you mind reading that for us? Mom. You and I went through a lot of life's challenges together. You lived every day of your short time on Earth to the fullest and never regretted anything. That being said, you were extremely careless and selfish with how you took care of your health. You continued to binge and indulge in a sugar addiction, even when you knew it could kill you. That decision ultimately left me without a mom. I love you so much, Mom, forever and always. Your only son, Kevin. When Kevin read those words, that's when I knew I was ready to make the change. You ready to take that journey? Let's get rid of it. Goodbye. Let's get rid of it. I know it's not going to be easy, because in order for something to work, it has to be a little bit of a struggle. That's when you really, really learn your lesson. Coming up, can Christine be pushed out of her comfort zone? Let's try something that even scares me a little bit. Oh How about God. that one? Octopus? <laughs> oh. Christine has had a sweet tooth since childhood, but her love of sugar turned into an obsession after her divorce 20 years ago. In order to start the healing process, Christine needs to face things head on from her addiction to sugar, to her fear of the water, to her painful past. I never went to my son or my daughter's graduation 
um, I never felt welcome. Yeah. That is moments I am never going to get back. I see the feeling when you talk about this. It's bitter, but you know what I also see? Pain. Sadness. There's a lot pain. of pain. There... In the right here and right now in your life, you can start spending time with your son. All of that other stuff, Christine, all of the past, if there's something that you cannot control in your life, we need to move you to a state of acceptance because you can't do anything about feelings of the past. The trick to creating happiness is to not make any room for them. I want you to fill your life with pleasure and purpose and power. Dr. Dowd helped me realize that I was the only person holding myself back. I have no one to blame with how I lived my life except for me. I'm gonna think differently now. The next morning, Dr. Dow wants to work with both Christine and Kevin to show them how to create a happy memory that doesn't involve sugar. This looks fun. <laughs> I have never in my entire life been in anything like this. It looks kind of small and unsteady. Uh huh. The next part of Christine's treatment will be to extinguish her fear of the unknown. This is important in treating her addiction because it will allow her to have pleasurable experiences and relationships. I want you to experience life, and I want you to teach yourself, I can do this. And I'm having a meaningful, loving life with people, with your son. It'll be fun. OK, keep telling me that. It will okay. be. The unknown is always frightening. You guys suited up. But I need to do this for myself and for Kevin. And I'm going to do this. Failure is not a word I want to use anymore. I'm going to help you guys get out here. I'm scared of water because I do not know how to swim. Are you sure you can do this? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Hey, why don't you get in while I'll pull it out? <laughs> When I first sat in that kayak, I thought, we're doomed. Then I programmed my mind that I have to trust and I have to create a moment. Yes. It was so amazing. When we were out there and things were real smooth, I'm like, this is so much fun. Good work, Christine. I totally let all my fears go, and I kept telling myself, we'll be fine, this is fun, this is fun. And then Kevin said, uh-uh, there's a wave coming, and I thought, oh, it'll be like a roller coaster. But I got up and saw Kevin. When I came to the surface and saw mom, she was laughing hysterically and having a great time. You did it! We did it! I was in the water! You did it! We did it! We did it! I don't think I've ever seen mom that joyous and having that much fun. And it made me feel ecstatic. This is the stuff of replacing food with meaningful relationships and experiences in your life. This memory did not involve me having to wake up thinking, we have to bake cookies. You know, this is something Kevin was excited about doing. And I got to do it first with my son. This is so exciting. We did it. Coming up, Christine faces a new food for the first time in years. I have to eat it. Dr. Dow and JJ have given Christine the tools to combat her addiction to sweets. Now she faces her first few hours without sugar in over 20 years. I'm having Christine get all of the enemies out of the house, out of her car, everywhere. The sugar, the junk food, it's all gone because she's strong right now. But in those moments of weakness, if it's right there, it's too easy. Sugar was my crutch. Throwing my crutches away, that's hard. The next day, Kevin is back in Texas, so Christine decides to check in via video chat. Talking to my son helped me tremendously. So be honest, how much sugar have you been eating? I would take a lie detector test. I did not have any jelly beans or licorice. But despite Kevin's support, 
That evening, Christine struggles when she sits down to her first home-cooked meal in over 20 years. That's been the hardest challenge for me. Okay. Most food to me is pretty blah. But I'm going to put them in my body, even though they do nothing for me, and I'm going to remind myself how it's going to give me that energy to walk all the way down to the water. Over the next few days, Christine attempts to step outside her comfort zone. But when she chooses to go out, it's alone. It's extremely tough for me to be social. It's not easy to put yourself out there. On the fourth day, the loneliness gets to be too much. And Christine gives in. I've had a few moments of weakness. I fell into my old routine of grabbing that candy. I know that taking two steps forward, sometimes you do take a step back. You know, that's with anything in life. Um, but when you do take that step back, I'm gonna be more aware of and, and ask myself, okay, why'd you do this and what triggered it? Realizing that loneliness is a key trigger for Christine, on day seven, Dr. Dow and JJ ask her to join them for dinner to encourage her to get out and be more social. Hi, you thank look you. fantastic. Thank you. Come have a seat over here. Okay. Tonight is the culmination of all of the things that she was terrified to do before. Trying new foods, being around people. It's having that experience that would teach Christine again she can do this. Oh my gosh! Oh, Kevin! Oh to up the ante even more. JJ and Dr. Dow have invited Kevin back from Texas and a few of Christine's acquaintances from work. Oh, you look lovely. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is going to be good. This is a Spanish restaurant. We're going to have tapas. What I want you to do is I want you to try things that are really a challenge for you. I'm so glad you decided to join me for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> the pleasure's out. Oh, OK. OK, I want you to look at things and go, what is the thing that almost scares me? Are okay. you game? Yeah. OK. Uh, That's all of us. Hey, what did I get myself into? When I went to that menu was extremely foreign. Date stuff with blue cheese. I don't like blue cheese. It's like mold. Will you but try it? I'm going to try okay. it. OK. Let's try something that even scares me a little bit. Oh How my about God. that one? Oh, what does it say there? Oh Octopus. Sounds delicious. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's try it. Sounds it. delicious. All right. The pressure is really on for Christine tonight. We're taking her far out of her comfort zone. Delicious. Oh, boy. Oh, there you go. What's the verdict? <laughs> I want to make sure that you get some octopus there. OK. There it goes. I have to eat it. You can spit it out. OK, I don't like <laughs> I don't like that. Christine wasn't that excited about the octopus. She tried it. She spit it out. But the most important thing was she gave it a go. I, I didn't it's like it chewy. either, Christine. We just wanted to make sure we really challenged you. <laughs> it was so gratifying to see Christine enjoying herself at the dinner table. It made me realize that she's taken that whole idea of the fun and the relationship with sugar, and she's been able to transfer it into something healthy. I'm leaving Christine feeling confident that she will continue to make the right choices in her life. The more she fills her life with pleasure and purpose, the less sugar will be tempting to her. I really, really am proud of you. And I want to I wanna congratulate you on doing such a great job. When Kevin turned to me and said, I'm proud of you, Mom, that's a moment every parent wants to hear in their life. Good work, Christine. To you. Before my mood was up, down, up, down, and I'd almost be yelling at people. Now, it's just one emotion. I feel excited. A freaky eater is someone who takes an eating habit to the extreme. Daniel is obsessed with raw meat. Uh. It goes down real smooth, you know? He loves the taste and texture. 
and completely disregards the risks. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I just really don't want my brother to end up dying from that one bad piece of meat. With one week of intense therapy, can specialists Mike Dow and JJ Virgin help Daniel let go of his dangerous obsession? What he is doing has real consequences. Before it's too late, your first sign could be death, and it's not a nice death. Twenty-nine-year-old Daniel has a typical varied diet, except for one freaky habit. Daniel has been obsessed with raw meat for the past six years. He feeds his habit four times a week in pound after pound of raw beef, eating whole steaks pulled right from the packaging. Mm. Even raw chicken. It isn't really normal for people to have the eating habits that Daniel does. Every year, 76 million people contract foodborne illnesses. Of these people, 375,000 are hospitalized, and approximately 5,000 die. I'm really concerned that Daniel doesn't care that one day this could lead to death. In fact, Daniel scoffs at the thought of getting sick. It's absolutely mm -hmm. worth it to eat raw meat, even though there's consequences. Consequences are minor. I like to pull it. I like to see the muscle. There's no real reason behind it besides I like the taste and the texture. It's like butter. Daniel's love of raw food started when he was a child. When we were kids, Daniel would always eat raw biscuit dough and pancake batter. It was one of many things that set Daniel apart in a strict military household. Well, Daniel has always just been a little bit different, particularly when it came to writing poems, stories, fiction. My father is always pushing me, wanting better, and kind of stressing accomplishments and goals and discipline. And I feel like I'm kind of unique and different from other people. While Daniel's brother followed in their father's footsteps by joining the military, Daniel chose to pursue a degree in liberal arts instead a decision not embraced by his family. My family didn't really support me in writing poetry. They just never really cared much, I guess. Once he left the strict confines of his parents' house, Daniel began experimenting with more raw foods. It was just a relaxing moment. One of those quiet things where you do it on your own and you're like, wow, this was nice. Soon, Daniel was indulging his raw meat cravings several times a week, but he only shared his secret with his brother. I thought it was just something he was trying out, but then it started progressing to three or four times a week, and that's when I really started to get concerned. After graduation, Daniel took a job as a government analyst and finally gained some respect from his family. It wasn't rewarding. I was dying a little every day. Depressed. Daniel eventually quit his job to pursue writing full time. I want to make some kind of a difference in the world, you know? That's why I like the whole creative angle. You can usually help people by doing what you're best at, I think. Daniel now spends his time doing what he loves most, writing, working out, and searching for inexpensive ways to feed his obsession. I like bargains, and I always look for the cheapest cut. I don't think he does any type of preparation to it, washing it whatsoever. Horrified by the risks Daniel is taking, his brother Bryant has begged him to give up raw meat. Daniel disregards any health advice he gets regarding the raw meat that he consumes. Some products may contain bacteria that could cause illness if the product is cooked improperly, or whatever. I mean, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I have never gotten sick from eating raw meat, ever. And I've been doing it for six years now. Mm. I just really don't want my brother to end up dying from that one bad piece of meat. It's gonna happen sooner or later. With nowhere else to turn, Bryant has asked Freaky Eater specialist JJ Virgin and Dr. Mike Dow to intervene. I'm JJ Virgin and I'm a board certified nutrition specialist. My name is Dr. Mike Dow. I'm a licensed psychotherapist specializing in eating disorders and addictive behaviors. 
Bryant has asked them to meet him at Daniel's gym in the hopes that a surprise intervention will inspire Daniel to change. So tell us a little bit about why you're here. I'm kind of concerned about my brother's eating habits. He likes to consume massive quantities of raw meat. Is he aware of the health consequences of eating raw meat? He's been told a lot. I just think he doesn't care. Daniel's raw meat eating habit is incredibly dangerous. The parasites, the bacteria, sooner or later, if you eat raw meat, you're going to get sick. One of the things I'm also concerned about is that, you know, he doesn't have a stable job, so he's buying whatever meat he can get, basically, so it might not be the highest quality, so. You could eat carpaccio, you could eat steak tartare, if you're choosing very high quality meats prepared by professional chefs. But Daniel is going and buying the manager's special, the cheapest, oldest meat. Why don't we go meet him? OK, let's All do right. it. We're going to go talk to Daniel. We're going to confront him about his behaviors. We're going to figure out if he is willing to accept our help. Coming up, faced with the facts, will Daniel be open to change? What he is doing has real consequences. I really don't want to change. Daniel has a disturbing obsession with raw meat that he indulges several times a week. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. His brother Bryant is hoping that a week of intense therapy with psychotherapist Dr. Dow and nutritionist JJ Virgin will convince Daniel to change. Daniel, hi there. Uh, what's up? I'm Dr. Mike Dow. Mike Dow. Nice Pleasure. to meet you. JJ Virgin. Good Pleasure. to meet you. Pleasure. I'm just going through my routine, doing my usual thing. And now here comes my brother with these like doctors and just totally took me by surprise. Dude, what's going on? The reason these people are here is because I called them about how you like to eat raw meat. I don't know if you really know how much this can affect your health, so they want to help you. Oh, OK, but I don't think I need help. I really do hope that they can just strike some chord with Daniel, but I know it's going to be hard. So I'm hearing that you're not convinced at all that this could be dangerous to you. That's absolutely right. You're making yeah. a joke of all of this that could kill you. What's up with that? I don't think it's that big of a deal. Driving's more dangerous, I think. Well, you know, things are a decision. You wouldn't drive on the wrong side of the street. No. And no. I hear a lot of these rationalizations, and all the rationalizations are geared towards you continuing to eat raw meat. That is correct. Absolutely. So it sounds like what you need is some information. Would you be willing to come with us so we can show you a few things and possibly change your mind? All right, but you got a big chore ahead of you. I'll just say that. I feel like they're talking down to me. It felt like a fight with me against three people. They were attacking me, not just my eating habits. Thank you. Since Daniel refuses to acknowledge the risks of eating raw meat, Dr. Dow and JJ want to introduce him to someone who can show him the danger he is facing. My name is Dr. Mike Carragher. I'm a board-certified family medicine physician. Raw beef is covered with microscopic organisms, viruses, as well as parasites. OK. okay. Uh, they're not visible to the human eye, but nonetheless, they're there. Right. Your first sign of eating a parasite or a virus or a bacteria could be death, and it's not a nice death. I haven't died yet. If we showed you evidence, would that help you to make some changes in your life? I don't know. I like really like it, and I really don't want to change. I see this cavalier attitude, this defensiveness. Daniel needs to put down his denial and accept that what he is doing has real consequences. To determine exactly what these consequences entail, Dr. Carragher wants to run some tests on one of Daniel's favorite foods. This is some ground chopped meat, which we got from your refrigerator. The test tab will reveal if E. coli is present in the ground beef. E. coli is incredibly dangerous. It starts with stomach cramps, diarrhea, headaches, fever, bloody stools, but then it can quickly progress to organ failure and death. While Daniel hasn't experienced the onset of these side effects yet, it doesn't mean they aren't in his future. If we look at the tip of the test strips, if there's any discoloration at all, it means there's a positive test. Right. So looks like our E. coli here has changed in color. So that's positive E. coli on the ground beef from your refrigerator, living on your chopped meat. 
The E. coli test they did came up positive, but I don't think it's a real biggie because I think my body's uh, naturally made to, to fight this type of thing. Is there such a thing as the body building up immunity? No. Actually, you're putting yourself at higher risk for disease the more raw meat that you eat. The easiest way to prevent oneself from being infected with these bacteria is cooking the meat adequately. One of the things that's going to make this more real for you is to see what's really going on inside your body. We're going to take a stool sample, send it off to the lab, and see exactly just what's going on inside your gastrointestinal tract. It's very likely that Daniel could have a parasite and not even know it. Coming up, Daniel and JJ go head to head. I'm digging in for another fight. Bro, meat's going. A day after he first met with Freak Eater Specialist, Daniel is still refusing to acknowledge the risks associated with eating raw meat. I haven't died yet. So Dr. Dow wants to speak with him one-on-one -on -one to see if he can uncover why Daniel adopted his habit in the first place, starting with his family. Tell me about your dad. He's authoritative. He's a military man, just like my grandpa was also a military man. It sounds like you took a very different path than the rest of the men in your family. That's true. How was that for you growing up or when you realized that you did not want to go on that path? I feel like I haven't fulfilled expectations yet. I, I still feel kind of disappointed. Daniel, you talk about yourself with this lens of I'm not good enough. Yeah, that's right. It sounds like you really have this need of wanting to figure out who you are, and you want to actually live the life that is Daniel, not anybody else. Yeah. What did you need from your dad that you didn't get? More support for uh, self-exploration, mm -hmm. I would say. More support of the arts. Mm. Maybe I have some issues about validation from my dad and uh, kind of meeting expectations in life. Tell me what being a man means to you in your life, Daniel. It means being proud of what I'm doing and uh, making a difference. If you had all those things in your life, what do you think might happen to eating raw meat? I wouldn't think about it as much anymore. That was the first time where I realized that uh, eating raw meat, it was about more than just food. He kind of opened that up to me. Thank you for being so honest with me today. Well, thanks for asking the good questions. My pleasure. Daniel's raw meat eating is about him not feeling good enough. He doesn't feel very supported in his family. The more we can find things to add to his life where he can get these emotional needs met, the less he will feel the compulsion to engage in these risky behaviors. Daniel may have a better understanding of why he's been eating raw meat but he is still skeptical as to why he should give it up. JJ hopes the results of his lab tests will change his mind. You ready? Yes. I have no idea what's going on, but in the back of my mind, I'm kind of digging in for another fight. Uh, you do have a parasite. Just the word parasites is kind of strong, you know, and it stood out there. We're not sure whether it is something that's, you know, attaching into your small intestinal wall and actually causing problems. Daniel needs to take these tests and go back and see his doctor. He needs to deal with this parasite. We watch for side effects here. We watch for any kind of diarrhea, nausea, headaches, fever. Daniel's attitude did a 180 degree shift as we started to review his test results, and it all became very real to him. One more thing that's of interest on this test, rotting protein that hasn't digested sitting in your gut. Now, if you tell me that I'm just going to keep eating raw meat, I'm going to tell you, you'll probably start gaining fat more and more because that's a definite thing that it does. I know it makes me seem shallow, but that is an important part of the argument about the fat and all that. What do you want to look like? I want to be a god on Earth. It would never work if we didn't fix this. OK. The turning point came when JJ told me how eliminating this could improve my life physically. So that means that the raw meat's going. If, it, if, like, yes, let's do it.
It just shows you what a big deal vanity is. You know, I sat there and showed Daniel how his raw meat dye could kill him, and he really didn't care. But when I tied it to how he could get a six pack, boom, he's all in. Coming up, Daniel tries to control his compulsion. I had that craving. But will temptation get the better of him? My mouth just started water. Determined to take control of his own life and forget the expectations of his family, Daniel has agreed to give up his dangerous raw meat habit. There's a very simple fix to Daniel's problem. He just needs to cook his food. So the first morning, he prepares himself a cooked breakfast. I've set my mind now to eating healthy and cooking my food and doing things right. It's hard to kick a habit. He's also adopted a new fitness regime to get the adrenaline rush that he used to get from raw meat. I feel healthy. After three full days without raw meat, Daniel is already noticing a physical difference. What's making me stay strong is looking in the mirror at my stomach and watching it get flatter. I'm going to hang in there. I'm not thinking about going back to eating raw meat because uh, I've got my eyes on the prize. Oh, here's an apron for you. Excellent. Inspired by his session with Dr. Dow, on the fourth day, Daniel decides to focus less on himself and more on helping others. At this point, what I want Daniel to add to his life are behaviors where he feels like his life has meaning. So he volunteers at a local soup kitchen. How are you doing? Oh, one day at a time. I feel that. I really like being around people and helping people, and I found that really rewarding. It's more deep-seated and not as temporary as eating raw food was. Good morning. Helping other people is definitely a lot healthier than uh, consuming raw food. But while volunteering has helped Daniel feel better about himself, it is not enough to keep the cravings at bay. By the fifth day, it gets to be too much. I have that craving. I want some meat. When he gets home, the familiar look and smell are all too enticing. My mouth just started watering, looking at this thing. I'm not. It was just tough, chewy, and disappointing. And I wanted it to taste good. I really did, but it just didn't. So I'm cutting through the meat, and I look over, and there's the other half of the meat I bought sitting raw. It's nice and red. It'd be so easy to just go over there and sprinkle a little salt on it. But I just shut myself off from it and just kept sawing through the thing I had in front of me. On day seven, Dr. Dow asks both Daniel and his brother to join him for one final exercise. He wants to make sure Daniel experiences both support and acceptance from his brother so that he can truly accept himself. Welcome to paintball. Brian is in the military and Daniel is not. And in a lot of ways, Daniel feels like he's not good enough. Let's do it. I'm Let's ready. get suited up. I wanted to put them on the same team so that instead of trying to figure out who's better, they could actually feel like brothers. Having that will allow Daniel to go to the next step where he fully accepts and approves of himself. Your brother and me were on your team. Good. That's the good news. The bad news is we are playing against three professional paintballers. The game we're playing is capture the flag. When you're on the field, it's one shot, one hit. If you are hit, you're out at that point. Game of your life in three, two, one, game on! The girl's right there. She's got the flag. Oh. I think I hit her. Ah. All right, I'll provide cover. You run over there. The flag is right there, okay? <laughs> I saw Bryant giving Daniel support and motivation. So you can do this, and this is our plan. That was the kind of support I wanted to see. You got me? Yeah. Go, go. Go, Danny. Game over! <laughs> Green team wins! All right, nice work, Danny. Well, well done. done. <laughs> nice work. Feeling good? 
Yeah. It was like a total adrenaline rush. My brother Brian and I definitely bonded over this experience. We got one last goodbye lunch for the two of you. The final surprise for Daniel and Bryant is a meal together with cooked steak. Having my brother here is great, because I think it takes someone really close to me to be able to get me to make a change. Dang, I don't want to say it, but it feels a little overdone. So do you still have the urge to eat raw meat? A little bit. I was always not wanting to change my behavior, but the doctors came, and I think it's important. We only want what's best for you, man. We're just trying to keep us all alive. That's, a bit, that's about it, man. Now that I've been through all of this, with uh, JJ and Dr. Dow and my brother and everybody. I'm not gonna eat raw meat anymore. How's the food? Hey, Dr. Dow. The best fact is I'm sharing it with my brother here, not necessarily the meat, but right. you know, it's the experience of the food, uh, which maybe is already an improvement. I'm talking more about the experience and not the food itself. And you're creating a positive association. Now it's gonna be up to you. That's always the hardest part. Daniel was living dangerously because he didn't feel accepted by his family. But with the help of the experts and his brother, he now feels supported in his life and no longer needs raw meat. All right, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming out. Victor's life is dominated by cheeseburgers. Burgers are so good. Eating the morning, noon, and night, every meal of every day for almost three decades. Victor is in the midst of a major health crisis. Now his health is in dire straits. The foods that I eat and the pills that I'm taking are just fighting each other, and, and unfortunately, the cheeseburgers won. And his marriage is falling apart. If he continues this way, I don't know how much more I can take. With one week of intense therapy, can specialist Mike Dow and JJ Virgin break this dangerous addiction? I've been trying to do this on my own. I can't, I need help. In order to save his marriage and his life. Victor is a true addict. I just can't see myself doing it. My name is Victor Munoz, and I'm a freaky eater. Victor lives on cheeseburgers and cheeseburgers alone. I love burgers. He eats four burgers a day, 28 each week, which is nearly 1,500 burgers every single year. I don't eat salad. I don't eat steak. I stay away from chicken. I don't eat any vegetables or fruit. I love fishing, but there is no way in hell I will eat a fish. Burgers are so good. From his burgers, Victor consumes over 88 pounds of fat every year and approximately 1.3 million milligrams of sodium. The reason why I enjoy cheeseburgers so much is because I know exactly what's going on inside there. It's simple. I like it a lot. But Victor keeps the extent of his burger obsession hidden from his wife of 11 years. Adriana thinks maybe I'll have three burgers a week. I'm really having over 20. In contrast to her husband, Victor's wife loves nothing more than to experiment with new foods. I'm going to culinary school. I love all food. I don't eat anything she makes. Nine to 10 times, I'll stop on the way home. Let me get a uh, cheeseburger plain. And get rid of the evidence and come in the house and then just kind of pick at what she made. Every time Victor doesn't eat something that I make, I take it very personal. I know it breaks her heart, you know, but I, it breaks my heart even more because you should see the spreads that she makes, and I just don't touch it. All done. Victor's aversion to his wife's healthy dinners also makes an impression on the couple's two children. It's difficult for me to push healthy eating habits on my children if Victor is sitting there with a hamburger. Dad doesn't eat healthy. Victor has been a freaky eater his entire life, refusing to eat even as a toddler. I would be so happy if I could get him to eat one good meal during the day. At age five, Victor discovered cheeseburgers, and from that point, would eat nothing else. I would have to make the same thing every day, cheeseburgers for breakfast, cheeseburgers for lunch, and cheeseburgers for dinner. When Victor and I first started going out, 
we went out to eat hamburgers a lot, and I was fine with it. I don't think I really noticed it until I wanted to start trying new foods, and I couldn't because of Victor. Over time, Victor became afraid of all other foods and insisted that his burgers be made a very specific way. Having lettuce, tomato, or onions touching my burger, I feel like I've been violated. If there's a piece of lettuce hanging on the edge of my bun, you know, I'll rip off like half the bun, if not the whole thing. In his mid-20s, Victor started to see and feel the side effects of his diet. Victor started gaining weight and started having some health issues. Now 34, Victor has ballooned up to 260 pounds. Two years ago, he was diagnosed with diabetes. I don't feel good at all. Victor's doctor prescribed him medication to keep his blood sugar down. The foods that I eat and the pills that I'm taking are just fighting each other, and I really feel sick. I felt like I had to choose between my pills and the cheeseburgers, and unfortunately, the cheeseburgers won. As Victor's health has deteriorated, so has his relationship with his wife and kids. When he gets home from work, our son wants to play with him, and Victor doesn't have the energy for it. I'm tired. I'm out of shape. And that, of course, affects our time with our kids, because Victor will just lay on the couch, and he'll say he doesn't feel good. I don't want to see where this is going to take him. I don't want to stick along for this ride. I don't want it. If I was by myself, let me rot, but I'm not. I got a family, and I, I got to take care of them. I am definitely trapped by burgers. I've been trying to do this on my own my whole life. I can't. I, I need help. With his marriage and health on the line, Victor has reached out to freaky eater specialists, Dr. Mike Dow and JJ Virgin. Over the next week, they'll use intense nutritional and psychological therapy to help him reclaim his life. I'm JJ Virgin, and I'm a board certified nutrition specialist. My name is Dr. Mike Dow. I'm a psychotherapist specializing in eating disorders and addictive behaviors. Dr. Mike Dow. Hi, how you doing, Doctor? It's clear that Victor can no longer handle this on his own. The consequences are adding up. He's feeling scared for his life and his health. So tell us what brought you here. Because my diet consists of pretty much burgers, and it's killing my health. I guess the obvious question here is, why haven't you stopped? There's nothing else that I want. Why couldn't it be that you'd have chicken, or a salad, or a piece of fruit? Oh, I, I can't physically get it in my mouth. Now, what about your wife? What does she think about the number of burgers you eat every day? She doesn't really know how many I really eat. She doesn't, I don't tell her. I mean, it's amazing she hasn't left me already. So what did those burgers actually mean to you? To me, the burgers are just safe. I, I don't know why it's progressed since I was a child. Addiction is a progressive disease. Victor is a true addict. What's more is that he can't control himself around his drug of choice. Victor, I think it's time that we went and had a talk with your wife. Are you willing to take that first difficult step? OK. All right, let's go. Okay. I think that's when I pretty much swallowed my heart. There's no going back at this point. Coming up, will Victor finally come clean to his wife? You need to trust me. Victor's obsession with cheeseburgers has him struggling with obesity and diabetes. While his wife believes that he only eats a few burgers each week, he's finally about to confess the truth. The fact that Victor is not telling his wife about his burger eating behavior tells me he's a little worried that she may not stick around. <sighs> Adriana, this is Dr. Mike Dow. How are you? Dr. Dow, this is Adriana. Adriana, nice to meet you. Wondering why I'm here? Yes. <laughs> Full disclosure from Victor to his wife is an essential part of treatment because he's at the point where he needs help. I, I haven't been real truthful. Some of the things that you don't know is that a lot of times when I leave here in the morning, I'll, you know, I'll stop at the, at the burger place, pick up food. Um, and a lot of times when I'm coming home and I'll grab food minutes before I come in the house. Um, something else. My, my sugar is extremely out of control. My blood pressure is just really high. The doctor, again, doubled, you know, my medication. Why? I'm not, 
because I'm not taking it. I don't, I don't leave you in the dark because I don't think you know you should know. I've we've been together for so long. I think I've I've more than have proven that I will be here through thick and thin. And you you know you need to trust me. But you need to help yourself. You need to help me help you. I will do whatever you want me to do, but it cannot be more of an effort on my part than yours. I mean, you're the one that's not feeling well. You're the one whose health is is in jeopardy. I felt very betrayed. I don't understand why he feels the need to keep those things from me. Victor, it sounds like you have been putting emotional things and needs onto burgers. Burgers are what make you feel safe. I don't want you to put your needs for safety onto a food that is gonna kill you. Dr. Dow made a good point. You know, I guess I, f I find safety in burgers because they're simple. And it sounded like he was trying to get me to say, like, if I have to find safety in something, find it in my wife, you know? I mean, that's what she's there for. Victor, it's time to start putting away that denial about the consequences of your behaviors because they're not just affecting you. Right. They are affecting this entire family. Let's do it. With Victor at this point, after these many years, seeing is believing. I will support him, but it's not up to me, it's up to him. Now that Victor has finally come clean to his wife, Dr. Dow wants to show them both how the addiction has been affecting the family with a dose of shock therapy. It's important for Victor actually see how many burgers he is eating in a year. Hi there, I'm JJ, I'm a nutrition expert. Nice to meet you. By seeing it, he can really come to terms with it. Got something to show you, come with me. Okay. I figured it wasn't gonna be good. I assumed she was gonna show me or tell me something bad. real burgers in there. When the burgers fell out of the truck, the first thing I did is look over at Adriana. So Victor, what do you think all of this represents? I'm assuming it represents the amount of burgers I eat in a five year span. Try a one year span. Wow. 1,460 burger boxes right here. What's it like to see them all here? It's just, it's just disgusting. It was very shocking and a little sickening, really. Victor, is it any big shock that you've got diabetes? Apparently not. The question is really, when's the blindness gonna set in? When are you gonna have to have something amputated? When's the stroke happening or the heart attack? Victor is in the midst of a major health crisis. What's it going to take? It's definitely going to take a change. I really hope Victor is able to make this change. He has been engaging in this addictive behavior for decades. There's a lot that's going to be difficult. So it's time for you to make a decision, Victor. This or your life and your family? My life and family, for sure. Coming up. Victor's commitment wavers. I just can't see myself doing it. <sighs> With his burger addiction destroying his health and his marriage, Victor has finally resolved to make a change. Which do you choose? My life and family, for sure. But in order to move forward, Dr. Dow will have to help him overcome his paralyzing fear of new foods using graded exposure therapy. Graded exposure therapy is, in layman's terms, baby steps. And those first baby steps are gonna use an existing behavior, an existing place, an existing food, and we're just going to add to it. I would like for you to order a burger with lettuce. <laughs> just straight lettuce? Just straight lettuce, burger with lettuce. Let me have a cheeseburger with just lettuce. I have never ordered a burger with lettuce, ever. It made me extremely nervous. So, how are you feeling right now about it? Uh, I can smell the lettuce. It's really grossing me out right uh -huh. now. All I want from you, Victor, is one bite. I'm used to picking off one or two pieces of lettuce. This thing was covered. 
I didn't know if I was gonna be able to eat it or not. I've been trying so hard. Damn, all right. All right, I'm gonna do this. You have to understand that I'm asking him to do something that he has not done for over 25 years. I realize that I have to do this. And if I want to get better, then I have to take the first step. Man, that's hard. After I started chewing it for a while and swallowed it, I realized, you know, it wasn't the end of the world. The sky didn't fall. So what did you just learn? That I can do this? Yeah. Encouraged, Dr. Dow wants to present an even bigger challenge, a food Victor has never tried in his entire life. Victor, I'd like you to order a burger with lettuce and mushrooms. Mushrooms? Mushrooms. Seriously. I'm stressing out. You know, what do, I don't know what mushrooms taste like. I've never had one before. Uh, I could just imagine them tasting like dirt. Wow. So that's what a mushroom looks like, huh? That is what a mushroom looks like. <laughs> Let's find out what a mushroom tastes like, more importantly. OK. Mushroom. All right. <clears throat> I wanted to throw up, but then I just kept chewing, kind of fought through it, and realized that mushrooms are really good. How's it taste? Not bad. What I love about that is Victor is not only extinguishing his fear, he's also discovering that there are some foods that he likes. You want to finish that? Or are you done? I'll take another bite. Yeah, all right. With Victor finally willing to try new foods. You should be thrilled. They're burgers. Now, there's not a beef patty on the table. JJ wants to start him on the path to healthier eating. What I like to do in retraining people's taste buds and getting them to eat healthy is to take the familiar, that's their unhealthy habit, and replace it. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're going to do. Our job is to find some new burger tastes that you like that are good for you. Okay. Ready to start? OK. OK, pick it up. OK. JJ has Victor try a bite of each of the new burgers. Chicken. Well, that just didn't taste right. Veggie and spinach. Until he finds one that he can stomach. Turkey. It's not bad. So you can do that one? Mm, it's got a lot of flavor in it. The burgers were the big unknown, but they were still familiar. When I moved into the condiments, I mean, here are vegetables. This is a man who runs from vegetables. There's just so much going on, I just don't know. Unfortunately, that caused a lot of anxiety. I just can't see myself doing it. There was too many flavors I couldn't wrap my head around. You know, I was just, I'm not used to all of that. This week, this is going to be your dinner each night. Now, see, I'm playing ball with you because I'm giving you burgers. Right. But it's going to be a healthier choice burger. Right. And you're not going to overthink it. I mean, if I could stop overthinking, then yeah, that would be awesome. Is this a deal? So, yeah, it's a deal. I'm scared that I might go back. If today, I don't want to. I don't feel like I am. But my track record shows otherwise. Coming up, with his life on the line, can Victor stick to JJ's plan? My head is really playing mind games on me right now. Dr. Dow and JJ have given Victor the means to overcome his burger addiction. Now, he faces the daunting task of continuing on his own. That evening, Adriana makes a healthy meal of chicken burgers for the whole family. And for the first time in a long while, Victor actually eats one of her new recipes. Eating with the family is definitely great. You know, I mean, all four of us are sitting down and eating the exact same thing. And it's less stressful on Adriana. It's, it's been great. How is it? It's good. It feels great to make a meal and know that we're all going to sit down and eat the same thing. After two days back on his medication, Victor is already noticing a difference. I've been like headache free for the last two days. That's so new to me. I haven't felt that in such a long time. 
waking up in the morning is really different now. I mean, I, I'm waking up with more energy. I just feel like I'm ready for life. But by the third day, Victor is struggling with his healthy burger options. The menu that Gigi wrote up started to remind me of burgers too much. I wanted a real burger. You know, I felt myself going through withdrawals, but I haven't cheated on this at all so far. As long as I can keep the cravings down, then, you know, I don't have to like food to eat it. After seven full days, Victor still hasn't touched a cheeseburger, and he rewards himself by going fishing. But even out at sea, he can't avoid temptation. It's a struggle in the boat because fishing boats have the best burgers in the world. Everybody ordered a burger, and I was sitting there with a granola bar. <sighs> well, every time I was reeling in a new fish, I kept saying, do I really want to eat this one? And I would just yank that hook right out of his mouth. No. <laughs> and then just go on to the next one. Dinner. There we go. Dinner. That same day, Dr. Dow and JJ have returned to plan a barbecue with Victor's wife and family to celebrate his successes and help him face his biggest challenge yet. Victor loves to fish, but sadly enough, he won't eat it. <laughs> I see you brought something for us. Yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> so you ready to eat what you've caught? Yeah, what the hell? All right, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about eating fish is making me really nervous. Thank you. What do we got here? I think we have bass. OK. It's really going through my head like crazy right now. I don't know if I'm ready. There it is. There it is. <laughs> There's a lot of things going through my mind, like, one why, uh, do I really want to do this? Breaks apart real easy, huh? I'm really trying hard to keep my mind off of the fish. <laughs> That's good. All right, <laughs> success. Victor has made those first steps, which are always the hardest. He is now going to have the self-confidence that he needs to continue to make progress and change. You ever think you were going to be here? No. Nah. Before starting this, I came to the realization that I was going to die young. But now, I feel like I can do it. Hey, Jenna, how are you feeling over there? Yeah, I can't believe it. I never thought that this would happen. Dr. Dow and JJ gave me my husband back, and I owe it to them. Victor was really at risk for having, you know, an early heart attack. Now, not only will he be able to be there for his kids, but he'll also be able to be a fantastic role model for them. <laughs> I feel like I've been in a coma. You know, I feel like I just woke up, and everything is just so new, and it's exciting. Cheers to your success. Cheers. A freaky eater is someone who takes an eating habit to the extreme. 29-year-old Amber lives on a diet of french fries. I like the way they make me feel. Every meal of every day for the past 26 years. If I didn't allow her to only eat french fries, Amber would not eat. And her seven-year-old daughter is following in her footsteps. These are really good. It's not an easy thing to live with, and I don't want to see that happen to my daughter. In just one week, Penn Specialist Mike Dow and JJ Virgin free Amber and her daughter from their disastrous diet? <laughs> or will the change push Amber over the edge? I can't do it. Amber's a tough case because Amber is only going to do what Amber wants to do. I want to get the hell out of here. My name is Amber, and I am definitely a freaky eater. 29-year-old Amber only eats french fries. Devouring in excess of 125 pounds of deep-fried french fries each and every month. Yearly, that's the equivalent of 6,000 potatoes. 115 potatoes every single week. Amber eats french fries breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But Amber cannot eat just any french fries. Smell, color, and texture are also important. A lot of the times, fries will have a burnt end like this. That is definitely something that I cannot eat. So I will take that and pinch it off and stick it underneath the napkin and then eat the rest of the fry. I will feel even a little euphoric after eating fries. I'm not sure what it is about them that makes them 
so good, but <laughs> I like the way they make me feel. Amber Scott grew up in the small rural community of Ennin, Ohio, the youngest of three children who, at first, had no problems with food. She was great with baby food, but between the age of three and four, she stopped eating everything other than french fries. I remember being a normal eater, and then every night, it just stopped. Amber's problem quickly progressed, and she began gagging on every new food. She would say, the smell was awful. If she tasted it, she'd spit it out, or she would actually vomit. If I didn't allow her to only eat french fries, Amber would not eat. Concerned, Amber's mother sought advice from doctors, who told her Amber would grow out of her picky eating, so she continued cooking Amber fries every meal of every day. This has been Amber's diet for the past 26 years. Now, Amber has a seven-year-old daughter of her own. McCartney's a picky eater, as well as her mom. While McCartney will also eat pizza and some fast food, she has recently started refusing more and more foods, the same way Amber did when she was three. McCartney treats foods a lot like how I treat them. She will gag at times. I don't like to try new food because it's gonna be like stinky or kind of gross. Amber is absolutely convinced that both she and her daughter have a genetic condition that makes new tastes unbearable. These are really good. They came out perfect. I want to teach her that if there's something different about yourself and you're not like everyone, that it's okay to be who you are. She has tried researching their condition, but she's only found a few other people who share her habits, and no one has been able to find a diagnosis. I've tried therapists, I've tried doctors, they don't understand. I've tried everything that I know, but I don't know how to change it. While Amber has not yet suffered any health problems from her diet, she knows all too well the mental anguish that comes with not fitting in. I've been chastised, I've lost friends. They'll say stuff like, you know, I can eat anything. And it's like, well, that's great, you know, good for you, but I can't. Feeling like an outcast, Amber avoids many social events for fear of being judged for a problem she can't explain. I don't want to have to answer someone's questions every day. And people get upset because they think, well, then you must be doing this out of choice, and it's like, I would never do this out of choice. Amber does not believe either she or her daughter can change, but she is desperate to understand her condition. I want to know why I'm like this. I want to find out. Looking for answers, Amber's called in freaky eater specialists Dr. Mike Dow and JJ Virgin for help. With one week of intense therapy, they'll attempt to free her from the agony of her restricted diet. I'm a psychotherapist specializing in addictive behaviors and eating disorders. Amber. JJ Virgin. Hi, Amber. I'm a board certified nutrition specialist. Why do you think that you're only reaching for those french fries? I feel that there is something beyond, oh, I don't want to eat that. I mean, that's definitely not it, because yeah. I do want to eat it. And there are foods that I have sat down and have tried. What happens? I, I throw it up. Okay, so I'm hearing you do want to try to eat healthy. Yes, I've tried. But you can't. I can't. I definitely am leaning more towards the fact that it's, it's medical because I know that I'm, what I'm doing is not a choice. I mean, even just one new food can open up a whole lot of options for me, even one. Good. Amber contacted Dr. Dow and I for help because she really wants to understand her problem I'm sending Amber to the lab to run some genetic tests because she needs to find out once and for all if something's going on with her. Coming up, will Amber finally find the answer she's been searching for? When the geneticists looked at yours, they called me because it's extremely rare. Wow. Amber believes she can only eat french fries because of a genetic condition that makes her gag on other foods. To determine if that is the case, nutritionist JJ Virgin had Amber and her daughter submit DNA samples to a genetic lab. Now the results are in. We're trying to find out if Amber has sensitive tastes, because if she does, it could make her a picky eater. I know that you've been waiting a long time to learn all of this stuff. Okay. Based on their genes, the lab categorizes people into two main groups, either tasters or non-tasters. 95% or more of the population falls into one of those categories. You know, we talk to those people, they're very sensitive to taste. 
they'll be the picky eaters, right? Trying to find something that they like. The non-tasters will have a tendency to overeat because everything tastes good to them. When the geneticists looked at yours, they called me because they'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> wow. Never. It's extremely rare. <laughs> so there's 55 different taste variations here. Yours follow no pattern at all. Your results were inconclusive, so it completely explains what you've been saying. Unbelievable. For the majority of my life, I've been shouting that this is not my fault, that there's something going on with me, and nobody wanted to hear that. And finally, it's a relief. What I want you to know now is it validates you, but it also doesn't validate this behavior. Your genetics will shape your behavior, but they aren't forcing it. You still ultimately have a choice. Amber's results mean that she will always have trouble adapting to a new taste, but it's not impossible. We aren't gonna really know what she's gonna like until she tries it, but what we do know is if she doesn't hate it, then that's a food that she can incorporate into her diet. The good news with your daughter is that she's a non-taster. That's good. Amber's daughter did not have that highly sensitive taste reaction. In fact, Amber's daughter is a non-taster, which would mean that her daughter should really like a wide variety of foods. Maybe you can have her help you. <laughs> McCartney's just a normal seven-year-old child who doesn't want to try her vegetables. And now I know that that's what I'm dealing with versus having a serious medical issue. So here's everything about you and everything about your daughter. And clearly we have some work to do. <laughs> now Dr. Dow wants to tackle the other side of Amber's disorder, the fear she feels when faced with a new food. If it started with a physical genetic piece, that emotional pieces of this disorder either can help it or make it worse. So we do have this strictly genetic and physical mixed with the emotional part of a disorder. Amber has learned this aversion towards choices because she does have this physical response and also a psychological one, the anxiety, the, the beating of the heart, the sweaty palms when she is approached with trying a new food. The treatment for your condition is graded exposure therapy. We are going to break down step by step by step the things that you want to do in your life. So before he has Amber tackle a new taste, Dr. Dow starts even smaller with a familiar food that only looks a little different. Start with tastes and also textures that you already like, and then we change one thing at a time. This is going to teach your brain that you can't eat this. I am very nervous, and even though french fries are a safe food, changing their color makes me feel uneasy. I would like for you to taste one of the red french fries. I feel like this is not a baby step, and this is not where I would have chosen to start. I guess it's this one. I wanted it over with. I just wanted to be done with the rainbow fries. How are you feeling right now? I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this. Every time you try something new, you are going to be one step closer to having the life that you want. Yuck. There was a real yuck face when you put that in your mouth. It wasn't pleasant. But it also wasn't extremely unpleasant. Right. The fact that Amber was able to take a bite to me is a success. I just want Amber to have a bite, to have the experience, and to say, did I die? No, and if not, then I'm okay. Building on her progress, Dr. Dow moves on to an even more unnatural color, blue. What are you feeling right now by looking at that blue fry? It looks like a dead blue finger. The average person may say, eating a blue french fry is no big deal. You know, why is she crying over this? But you have to understand that for Amber, emotionally, it's like jumping out of an airplane. <laughs> Here. I want to give you a huge amount of credit for what you just did. I knew that any step that we take is going to 
provoke some fear in Amber. But the fact that she was able to take this step says that she can indeed make changes to her diet and her life. This was hard for you, and you did it. Coming up, will Amber give up on her treatment? Amber is only going to do what Amber wants to do. And I can't do it. After a day of intense therapy, Amber has made the first difficult step in treating her psychological fear of new foods. The next evening, Dr. Dow and JJ want to see if she can take an even bigger leap and try a new taste. Amber is used to eating deep fried potatoes every single day. I thought the easiest step for her to make was to stay within the deep fried and then try new tastes in that fashion. JJ orders a variety of different vegetables, ranging from the familiar, like potato, to the unfamiliar, such as carrots, asparagus, and mushrooms. All right, so where do you want to start? Shall we start easy? Um, all right. OK. JJ wanted me to try deep frying the potato. I was apprehensive on so many levels. What does it smell like? It smells like a potato in canola oil. Now, whether it smells like a french fry. But we have something in the ballpark of familiar, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, geez. See, I don't think this is, I don't think this is food. I don't think it's anything, you know? Logically, going to kill you? No, but I mean, eating dirt won't kill me. It doesn't mean it's a good idea. She uses so much all or nothing thinking. She uses a lot of catastrophic thinking. I want Amber to understand that there is some gray area here. Not everything has to be pleasant to her, but it doesn't have to be all bad. But you could eat this and keep it in your mouth, right? Probably. Well, in that case, bon appetit. <laughs> That tasted like sod. Why are you looking at me that way? It did. Amber's a tough case because Amber is only going to do what Amber wants to do. All of us on carrots? Sure. Ready for carrots? To keep moving forward, JJ suggests another mild tasting vegetable, a carrot. Is that right? Is that how it's supposed to look? I've never had a deep fried carrot before. Try so. new things. Okay, so what did you teach yourself today, Amber? I didn't teach myself anything. None of this came as a surprise. You look really angry at us right now. I'm angry because what did you, you know, what do you want me to do right here? I'm I'm trying, but when I you know, I I keep getting pushed a little, pushed a little, pushed a little. I'm pushed to my limit for the day. Then that's all you had to do. Okay. Did you get that you did exactly what you could do and that's all we expected of you? Amber gets really flustered. That tells me that there is such a reaction in Amber with her emotion that a lot of these things aren't going to click for her until maybe tomorrow the day after. Our intention is not to get you mad. It is to help you to move forward. I want to get the hell out of here. I am seriously pushed to my limit for today, guys. And I can't do it. Meltdowns are not a success but they're also not a failure. I expect a lot of unpleasant emotions, fear, anxiety, worry, when it comes to graded exposure therapy. Let's get you home. After two days of intensive work, Dr. Dow and JJ are leaving Amber to continue on her own. But before they do, they need to see if she is willing to fully commit to treatment. Even though Amber had a meltdown yesterday, we're not giving up on her. We're gonna make sure that we help Amber stay in forward motion. So, Amber, yesterday was a tough day. Yeah. What was that like for you? It really showcased how emotional this issue can get. Rather than creating a whole new menu for the week, JJ and Dr. Dow simply want Amber to commit to trying one new food. Is there one that kind of pops up that you'd be willing to give a shot? For a while now, I've been considering a baked potato. OK, thank you. It's not the outcome that's the important part. It's the willingness to try. 
Okay. Okay. Tomorrow will be a reevaluation. It's just going to involve me seeing what is the best plan of action. Coming up, on her own, can Amber conquer her fear? I don't like the way this smells. Ugh. Dr. Dow and JJ have left Amber for a few days to carry on with her treatment alone. All I wanted to do with Amber this week was get her to stay in forward motion. And I didn't really care whether she liked a new food or not. I just wanted to make sure that she was willing to try new things. On the first day, Amber is determined to move forward for herself and her daughter. So she decides to try JJ's homework. I had chosen the baked potato because it's very similar to a french fry, and I thought maybe I could do it. I don't like the way this smells. I'm looking at the potato. I'm just trying to remind myself it's the same stuff that french fries are made out of. If I can just take a bite and tolerate it and get used to it, this would really be a very good thing for me. slimy, it's not as close to a french fry as I expected it to be. But I think it is something that I can incorporate. I just need to work with it a little more. After her success with the potato, on day three, Amber gets really aggressive and attempts another food she has been considering for the past few months. I have decided to try to make tacos. Ugh. But it's too much too soon. I really took it into consideration, but at the end, I really couldn't get myself to try it. By day four, Amber is unable to stomach anything new and is back to eating french fries three meals a day. I don't think recovery is going to be easy at all. At least now we know where to focus our efforts. But in terms of trying food, that's going to be difficult for a very, very long time. On day six, Dr. Dow and JJ want Amber to start incorporating her daughter into her treatment. So they've asked them to meet up at a local farm. Hi there. Hi. We came here because we wanted Amber to have an experience with her family, picking some fruits, some vegetables. The more Amber can actually touch and have this experience, the less fearful she will be around food. They hope that McCartney and Amber will be able to encourage each other to try new foods. And they let McCartney lead the way. McCartney spotted the cucumbers. Full heart. All right, <laughs> nice work. OK, now what's our deal with these foods? What if we don't like it? Spit it out. What if we do like it? We swoon. And what if we just think, huh, I'm not sure. What do we do? Try again. Try again. Try again. I don't know that I'm going to be able to tolerate the cucumber. I'm not sure that it's going to work out for me. But I want to be a good role model for my daughter. All right, ready? swallow your cucumber, you, you high five me. Ask you are cucumber. good. And? I swallowed mine. It tasted like water to me. So is this something that we could incorporate into your diet and you'd be good with that? Um, I like cucumbers. <gasps> I like that. I oh. like that. It's exciting to see Amber motivating McCartney and then in turn McCartney motivating Amber. It was really incredible and I'm excited because I think both of them are going to be able to help each other on this journey. I was proud of my mom for trying new foods. Overall, going from a girl who was crying eating a blue french fry to trying new vegetables in the course of a week? What a huge win. You know, you take a tiny little thing and you see if you like it. You're just checking it out. You're just just seeing if it's going to work for you or not. I'm so excited. I, I feel like this is a new beginning for Amber. Good work today. I'm really excited and optimistic for the future. So let's go celebrate your success. I have a lot of things I can do for myself, for McCartney, and I can't wait to get started.